Hello, and welcome to Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain, and I'll be your host as we delve into the world of the artist and the art that's all around us. Talk Art is sponsored by the Silicon Valley Open Studios. During the first three weekends in May, hundreds of local artists open their studios to the public. For more information, you can go to the website svos.org. Our guest for Talk Art is Karen Wong, who is a painter who has made the very interesting transition from realistic watercolors to abstract acrylic painting. And she's here to discuss that fascinating transition. So welcome, Karen. Thank you, Sally. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What is some of your background that got you creative and artistic? Well, um, about 17 years ago, when my daughter was three, I decided that I wanted to start doing something interesting with my evenings. At the same time, we had just moved into a big house with lots of empty walls, and I wanted to put some watercolors on my walls, so I took a community watercolor class. Wow, and that got you started in painting. It did. I, I took that class once a week for about two or three years. I almost quit many times oh. because I was so <laughs> dismal at, in the beginning. But um, I stuck with it and uh, eventually had the opportunity to meet a woman from the Santa Clara Valley Watercolor Society who was involved in the workshop committee. Oh. They bring in marvelous artists from all over the United States to come and do week-long workshops. And so I studied under many of those great artists. Wow. So you work directly with active artists who actually are in their artistic career. Yes, absolutely. Oh, there many times there are only... 15 or 20 artists working with them during that week. So we get a lot of hands-on experience. Oh, excellent. So workshop, very mm -hmm. interesting. So you work a lot in series, and you brought some images to talk about, about you know, your interaction with the classes and also mm -hmm. some of the series that you've done. So let's take a look at those images now. OK, that sounds great. Thank you, Sally. Um, the first image that I brought along is called Worship. And I brought that because uh, that was number four in a series called The Pianist. And it was the very first time I took the workshop from Mike Bailey called Watercolor Beyond the Obvious. So Mike uh, does this 10 week long class where you have to do two large paintings each week. All the paintings have to be of the same subject. Wow, so how the, large is that painting? Uh, 22 by 30. Okay. So the week before I did that painting, I had done a, a black and white version of the pianist's hands on the piano keys. Just a very realistic, but it was all black and white. And as I was sitting looking at the, the fingers striking the keys, I began to think about what my daughter's piano teacher had said, that it is the pressure and the placement of the fingers as they strike the key that creates the beauty. And um, it was very exciting to me to think about that is kind of how God works in my life. So um, sometimes it feels like pressure. Sometimes it feels painful when he's trying to teach me something. But it is that exactly right pressure in exactly the right place that produces the beauty. So I decided to try to put that into a painting, and that is when I painted this painting. Interesting. I like the way the light shines through it. And it looks sort of watery as well. Well, as I was painting it, I started to think about the hands as mountains and the keys as a waterfall. And actually, I was very disappointed with this painting when I got done with it. But we still had to stand up with our paintings in the class and show them to the class. And as I stood there, I felt so bad about how this wasn't the perfect painting I had expected it to be, that tears began to drip out of my <laughs> oh. eyes from my frustration. But I noticed that the class was moved for a very different reason because they saw the meaning in the painting. And that was a huge aha moment for me to see that a painting doesn't have to be technically perfect in order to speak to the heart. And that was what really set me on my journey to begin trying to paint more conceptual paintings to uh, try to interpret what was in my heart onto the paper. So this is from a series of, of mothers and daughters that I did. It's called Coming Home. 
And uh, I, there I was working with abstract shapes to try to show the relationship between the mother and a daughter through the color and the shapes. And um, that's a I'll look at and that one. This oh, that's is very different. Yes, this is very different. This was uh, probably number 18 of 20 in a series called The Living Water. And it, uh, this one is representing the bridge, the chasm with the bridge. And I don't know if you can see it, but that's a Christ figure. The water actually is a Christ figure spanning the chasm. Interesting. And then when you look at that, it looks very drippy. What media do you use? That, that? one was watercolor. I was okay. still working in watercolor at that time, but I was becoming more free. So I was throwing the paint on there, hitting it with a spray bottle, letting it splash and, and letting the color splash back up. So the waterfall effect almost just comes from all the water that I put on the paper as I was working with the paint. Beautiful. Thank you. This is from a series that I did called Still Life. And that series, it was always uh, in the same formation of a vase of flowers with five small circles. Sometimes the circles were oranges. In this case, they're roses. And um, I was, it, here I began to experiment with using tempera over a watercolor base. Hmm. And that's why I could get that misty look, uh, working, just working white tempera into the existing watercolor that's underneath. And um, I'm not sure what's coming up next. <laughs> OK, this is from the uh, series called Essence. And this one was Essence Rain. And this is where I began to play with the whole idea of acrylic and letting the acrylic drip. And so there's a lot of drip work in there. And uh, there's some direct brush work. But even when I was doing this painting, I was discovering that it's very frustrating for me to work with a brush with acrylic, especially if I'm not keeping it very, very wet. So after I did this series, I began to um, play around with some other ideas of how to get the paint on the canvas. So how did you get it to drip like that in the background? Uh, well, you have to have your surface pretty wet. And then you take a fairly uh, thin uh, probably get the paint about the consistency of cream, maybe. Hmm. Just take a big brush load of it and spread it across the top and let the drips start to form. You can play with the drips a little bit to get them to go where you want to them to, or you can add more in by just uh, spraying with a water bottle. And this one is called Freedom. This is the last in a series of 20 that I, the series is called Identity. And it is searching for that uh, relationship with God. And in, in this freedom, I'm representing the freedom and the joy that I felt when I came into that relationship. It's very interesting patterning that you've done in the background. How did you get those beautiful patterns in the acrylics? Oh, thank you. Well, so I was working with trying to get a value pattern there, dark against light, and then the, um, the actual patterns that you see are mainly collage. And those collage pieces are um, uh, pieces of paper that I printed myself using paint and stamping and drawing, um, creating the paper, and then applying it to the painting, and then painting over it again. Wow. This is when I really began to work on this uh, process of transferring the paint using something other than a brush. So this entire painting was done with my transfer method of either stamping with a stamp that I carved myself or using newsprint or using foil to transfer the paint onto the canvas. So there's no brush strokes, no There are no brush strokes brush lines. directly on the paper there. I did use the brush when I, well, let me show you. OK, let's Can I take a look at the demonstration. OK. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> this is a method that I have found very, very useful. Just need some place to spread out my paint a little bit. And I have here a couple of things. This one is um, just to show you how I prepare my surface. I always take gesso 
and I put a fairly thick layer of gesso on the surface and then I carve into it with different kinds of tools. Um, I might use a palette knife, I might use one of these little soft headed tools that are similar to a brush. I might spread it on using this. Um, sometimes I'll make circles using something like this or I just draw right into it. So and that very layered texture look starts yes. on the background. Oh. That's right. So I might have stamped into it here. I don't know if you can see that where the shadows are cast. Yes. So <clears throat> that's how I prepare it. Then I'll put a layer of transparent paint over it. And here you can see once the transparent paint is on, you can see that this texture was built in with bubble wrap. This texture was built in with a comb. This was just carved in. Very interesting. So, so what, what surface is this? Looks this, is, this is just a piece of watercolor paper, but it has a nice thick coat of gesso on it that's been it's very thick. prepared. And then the other one is not paper. No, this one is matte board. Once you use this gesso process, you can use almost anything to paint on. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So um, what I'm going to do here, just to show you, this is a red orange, and so in order to get a beautiful contrast, we're just going to spread this out a little bit. And then I'll take this stamp. And did you create that stamp? You carved it? I did. Into? This is not a carved one. This is one of those that you use a heat gun and you impress it into something. Oh, interesting. So it kind of melts? It kind of melts a little bit. So then you'll see what happens. It, um, you can press more or less, and you get a pattern, and you get that shimmer when the orange shows through. Now, if I want to um, get a little bit different variety of things, I could come in with something like this and stamp and maybe get a little bit more coverage. So are you working on the background at this yes. point? You what I do is I build in a, a very complex background and once this layer is down, I'll so go you, in with other colors. What is that? <laughs> that <laughs> this like is the, uh, the inside um, protective label from a can of uh, powdered milk. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it looks... You can, you can use anything packaging. you want. Yeah. Wow. So let me show you something that so has a little bit more of a... you just look for interesting textures. Some of them you build, like this one, it looks... Did you carve these out? That was a placemat that I cut up into pieces. Oh, so this is something that was pre-made. Very interesting. Yeah. So here I have some bubble wrap. And I'll do the bubble wrap. And we'll go in and maybe even go over that stuff that we just did. Oh, so this is how you get that wonderful layered look so yes. that none of your lines are exact. But how, do you, how did you make something like the lute in the, a distant city? Okay, I mean, that was so, a shape, right, that you well, must have so had? Well, so there, um, let's see if I take a piece of newspaper. And if I take some paint here, we're almost running out of paint, and I go across it like that with the lines, then I press it down like that, the lines will come off on the painting. Aha. Uh -huh. So you can put more or less paint on, depending on what you have. I see the lights in here are kind of... So the strings on the lute were created that way. There you go. Wow. And if I am trying to protect a certain part, I'll just build a little mask like this. And then um, go right up against the mask with my Oh, I see. So creating wrap. a face or something Yeah, so of you that see nature. then I can get an edge there Very like nice. that. And what that does also is it creates these wonderful broken edges. So I don't have to have anything that's too literal. Mm -hmm. Gives me an opportunity to have some mystery there. So first you layer your working surface, whether it's paper or canvas or the boards, 
with gesso and it's white and then you mm -hmm. add, then you add your layers of color mm -hmm. wow. yeah and would you and do then, some drip work on this as well or would you um just... i have in some cases we'll see some as we move along where i did that as we you'll see that in one of the dragonfly paintings um cool once I will get this all covered, obviously I would be using many other colors. I didn't bring that many colors tonight, but I would layer one color over another so that I can build up uh, a density of color and get this covered. But the orange will always still show through yeah. and create that little sparkle. Because of the way you transfer it. Right. Oh, and so nice. then at the end, I will take a look at this and I will say, wow, that looks like a what does that look like? You know, maybe I can see something in there. Maybe I can see a dancer in there. And I might pursue that look of the dancer and I might begin to paint something from that. Or I, if I, in the case of the lute player, I had something in mind and right. so I pursued that from the beginning. Well, let's take a look at some of your other paintings. You have some that go deeper into a particular series yes. that you uh -huh. wanted to show us. So let's sure. take a look at those okay. now. That sounds great. This is called Dragonfly Pearl. And this was one that I started out in the same way where I did a lot of um, very intricate under carving with the gesso at the beginning. And then I did an, just an abstract with, um, with line and color underneath. I think this one started out mainly with gold and black actually. Wow. And then I began laying on the color using a lot of these processes and discovering some interesting things. But then I decided to use the drip method on this, and so I went after it with uh, reflective paint, just big sloppy brush loads of reflective paint across the top and let the drips come down. So you'll see in the wings that there are a lot of lines coming from the drip work. Right. But then behind the wings, I went back in with a brush or a palette knife and backed that out so you only see the drips in the wings and a little bit coming out of the wings. And this is called Metamorphosis. That was also from the Dragonfly series. Uh, the Dragonfly series, the concept of it was to use a square canvas and then to divide it into four unequal uh, rectangles. And so I wanted to make all of the paintings using that same format. So in this particular one, I covered the entire canvas with lots and lots of vivid color using, uh, well, first I had an underpainting, a very dark underpainting. Then I went after it with a palette knife, lots of vivid color. And then I just backed out with gray to let the dragonfly show. But an interesting thing happened on the way to the <laughs> dragonfly. Right. Down in the lower right-hand corner, this little figure seemed to arise. I think you can see yeah, the little do. figure down it. And when that figure began to arise, I decided I just couldn't cover that up with the gray paint. So I kind of made a little home for it down there in the corner. And after I painted it, I thought, now, why did I do that? And I looked at it and I realized, you know, that, that little figure is kind of messy and um, kind of scattered and not all there. And that's kind of the way I think about myself a lot of the time. <laughs> But someday, I'm going to look like that dragonfly. Well, and um, Beautiful layers there. That, I really see that technique of the colors showing mm -hmm. through the colors. That's a really interesting way to do it as well. Yeah, so I had a lot of fun with that one. This is also from the Dragonfly series, and this was done using this layering technique almost exclusively on that painting, except for the, the tree trunks. That was done with drips. So those are tree trunks. Interesting. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, you can also read it as wings. Right. So I was trying to, to have it read as um, yeah. two different things going on at the same time. This one's called Rebirth. Um, now, this is not the same series, right? No, this is, this is not the same series. This is actually from a series called Universal Truths. I only have about 10 or 12 paintings in that series. But um, this particular one, I was thinking about Genesis and um, the beginning of all things. So you have an idea and then you work from that. Do you have a plan to say, oh, this is what Genesis looks like to me or? No, actually it sort of arises organically. That particular one I started by um, doing the under thing with the gesso and then I just dripped ink from one end to the other. And the ink follows 
if you can imagine dripping ink on this, it's kind of like playing a pinball machine. The ink So this painting here in front of you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like the, the sample that I showed with the carved gesso, the ink would trail down and then uh, created those lines. Is that how this one was made, the line dance? Now this one was very different process here. I had in mind uh, doing something that was all linear and so I did the <laughs> lines first. Oh, and then after I did the lines, I decided what kind of color I wanted to put around them. So the blue was actually done with a brush on this, but the colored sections were done with the same technique that I demonstrated. Interesting. And oh, wow, look at those beautiful colors. Now this one was done entirely with a palette knife, but the palette knife drags in a very interesting way when you have this undercoat with the carved gesso. So uh, the paint, when the paint goes on, it will let the underlayer show through. And this painting was a challenge in many ways because when I first painted it, it started becoming so literal and it wasn't, uh, what I, it wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. So I took a big brush load of white gesso and started painting out big sections of it. And all of a sudden I got an idea. Oh, I think I know what to do with it. Let's go back to the beginning and think about value patterns think about working on the big masses and that was when I started to work all that color into the foreground and chose to do all the heads the same color to make them dark against the light background and it all fell into place. Oh, it's beautiful, really Thank beautiful you. painting. I like the green in that. It really just makes the whole thing shine. Well, you know, color is all context. So you notice that that green was up against the red. And so right. that makes the green really sing. And when you have a yellow against a lavender, it will make both of them sing in a way that they won't if they're in some other context. So, so when you're in your studio, you plan that part out? When you're, or you... Well, I think in the beginning I did. Right. Um, I took the Watercolor Beyond the Obvious class eight times, wow. so a total of 80 weeks. And each time we were working with line, value, color, direction, texture, all of these things. And so um, studying them over and over, applying them over and over, eventually they become integrated and sort of become organic in what I do. Well, they're beautiful paintings. And Thank I really, you. I really admire the way the color just shines through it. Some, you know, in some abstract paintings, the color can be messy, but you have such a nice control over it, even though oh. <laughs> you don't use any brushes for, yeah. <laughs> for very few. Well, it doesn't feel like control at some times, but <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. Decision-making process and practice. Yeah. Clearly, you put a lot of practice into it for the entire series. Well, I mean, one that's... of the reasons I did this is that when you do watercolor, everything is um, magical. <laughs> Things just happen, and you right. have all these happy accidents. But when I transitioned to acrylic, every single decision is intentional. And I was finding that I didn't know how to make those intentional decisions to create the look that I wanted. So that is why I began to do the, the gesso underpainting, right. the colored underpainting, so that I could have some happenings that would inform my process. Interesting. So where can people see your art? You're a member of the Silicon Valley Open Studios, yes, right? Yes, I am. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your shows there. I have a studio every year, and we're in Los Altos. And um, over the years, we have gotten bigger and bigger. So we probably have 200 to 300 people come for a wow. weekend. That's and great. we try to make it into a big party. Um, so when you say we, there's a group of people that show? Usually, I have at least three to four artists with me, yes. And uh, some of them have been with me since the beginning. I think this will be my 14th year. Wow. And um, we make it into a big party. We have wine tasting. We have lots and lots of food. Each one of the artists brings their specialty. Oh, excellent. Um, that does sound like fun. We have tents set up all over the yard. And then we move all the furniture out of the house. And the entire <laughs> inside of the house becomes my gallery. So. Excellent. So you also have a very, a, like a different line of painting experience that you do. Tell us a little bit about how you do art with groups of people. Okay, so say. I guess I could call this performance art. Performance art, yeah. okay. Yeah, um, actually I call them progressive paintings. 
and the idea I I started doing this for parties and eventually transitioned into doing it for large fundraisers. Oh, interesting. And now I occasionally do it for corporate events. So what we do is um, <coughs> each of the people that, <laughs> I guess I'm looking at myself now. <laughs> so um, the, uh, uh, each the of the people that come to the event will put some color on the canvas. I go in with a prepared canvas or a prepared piece of paper. Everybody puts some color on there. I have to kind of cajole them sometimes right. to be participating. And they'll just take a big brush load of whatever color they want. They can make whatever mark they want. And in the end, the whole thing is covered up with paint. And then I look at it and I think, do I see anything in here that I can make this into? Or am I going to make it strictly into an abstract painting? Right. But I spend the next hour at the event with my brushes and my tools and whatever mm -hmm. I have and some white and black gesso and whatever else I need and I go after it and I turn it into a finished painting and then at the end if it's a fundraiser they have a, a live auction and they auction the piece off there. If it's a corporate event then the corporate group gets the painting for their offices when I'm finished. Cool so it's participatory but then also looks professional at the end which is what you want in a piece of art when you're looking at it. Well, that's really very interesting. So um, it's been a pleasure talking to you for Talk Art. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the opportunity, Sally. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, and to close, we have some of the paintings that you created using your performance art. I think oh, you have some great. examples. So uh -huh. we'll take a look at those while the credits are rolling. Okay, but thank you great. very much. Thank you.